Um, yeah, so thanks very much for the, uh, the introduction, Carolyn, and, and the invitation to speak, Gary, and, and, and the other organizers at Active Motif. This is I mean, it's a really fantastic um, symposium that you've put together, so I'm, I'm very honored to be able to speak at it. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk today about some uh, unpublished data, um, as, I, as I say, link, you know, potentially linking the role of, of HERA um, or the role of HERA potentially linking embryonic development to, to late life aging. Um, so, you know, in my lab, we're, we're very interested in the, the biology of, of aging. Um, and you know, aging and development are typically considered to be you know, two quite separate processes, okay? So, so development is, is the, the development and growth of a mature, fully functional multicellular organism from a single fertilized uh, oocyte or, or zygote, typically thought to, you know, to stop in adolescence or early adulthood. And then the process of aging uh, takes over. And this is the decline in function and loss of resilience, increased risk of morbidity, disease, and, and death, okay? And as I say, we, we generally view these as being two quite separate processes. Um, but if you imagine a, you know, a pluripotent embryonic stem cell at the very early stages of development, ultimately that cell is, you know, generates the, uh, the unipotent adult tissue stem cells, which are responsible for maintenance of our of our, our adult tissues. And ultimately it's the decline of these stem cells, which, which in part contributes to, to tissue aging. Okay, so this just is meant to illustrate one mechanism by which the aging process is actually connected back to the earliest stages of development um, through intermediates such as these adult tissue stem cells. Um, so it is reasonable to wonder you know, what it, to what extent does the integrity of, of early embryonic development ultimately impact on the late life aging process? And that's, you know, something that we've become interested in recently. So there is actually evidence from model organisms that, that these kind of coupling mechanisms exist. So for example, it's long been noted that if you look at genetically identical worms, just consider these, these these black dots here, okay? So genetically identical worms in an identical environment, they actually have very different lifespans. Some of them might only live 20 days, some of them live up to 80 days. And some people, for example, Tom Johnson have shown that, you know, a report, a specific stress responses, response of reporters, which are active, you know, very early after hatching of these worms, the activity of these reporters can actually predict the lifespan of those worms, okay? Suggesting that events very early in development are actually determinants of, of late life health, late life aging and, and longevity. Um, and there's also very nice work from Andrew, Andy Dillon looking at uh, mitochondrial interventions during embryogenesis and showing that those can affect um, longevity of, of worms, okay? So it seems that embryogenesis and longevity are connected in, in model organisms. Um, what about in humans? Well, there is evidence that um, for you know, these kind of coupling processes in, in humans as, as well. Um, and so these are typically thought of as being, um, you know, dependent upon nutritional status of, of the embryo, for example. So fetal over or under nutrition of a developing fetus can determine the, the, the rate of aging and the predis predisposition to, to healthy aging or unhealthy aging in, in later life. And one example of this is what's known as the, the Dutch hunger winter. So at the end of the Netherlands, oh, sorry, at the end of the Second World War in the, in the Netherlands, there was a, a, a famine. And, and it's been noticed that you know, individuals who were uh, in utero developing as, as embryos during that famine have subsequently been shown, you know, 70 years later, to be at higher risk of um, various um, common diseases of aging, mostly uh, metabolic diseases, heart disease, uh, obesity, etc. And so, you know, obviously, people have been interested in the, 
the underlying mechanisms. And it's been noticed that you know, individuals who were in utero at the time of this famine have altered uh, methylation of, of their DNA, uh, including at genes which control metabolism. And so it's been proposed, for example, by Aline Slagboom and Baz Hyman's, that epigenetic mod modulation of pathways by, by prenatal malnutrition may promote an adverse metabolic phenotype in, in later life. And so, you know, with this as, as background then, hopefully convincing you that the integrity of early embryonic development can be a determinant of late life, healthy aging and, and longevity. I'm gonna tell you how we've kind of stumbled into this area through our studies of the, the her -A, histone chaperone. And this is a chaperone complex that, you know, my lab has studied now for, for several years, actually going back to when I was a, a postdoc in, in uh, Bill Kalin's lab at the, the Dana-Farber. I, I first got interested in, in her A as a candidate cyclone CDK substrate. Um, since then, you know, been collaborating with, with Ronan Marmestein on, on, this, on this project. And Ronan's lab have generated a number of you know, really nice crystal structures solving de various different parts of this complex. And this is a, 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 a simplified view of that, that complex whereby the her -A protein is, is really a scaffold for these other proteins. And this complex works to deposit the histone H3.3, H4 um, into, into, into nucleosomes. Okay, so HER-A deposits histone variant H3.3 and H4 into chromatin in a, in a DNA replication independent manner. Um, it's also been noted that um, histone H3, well, so histone H3.3 controls transcription. Um, H3.3 is thought to, to predispose to transcription activation and has also been implicated in, a, in a, an, an epigenetic memory process, which may be relevant to what we're studying here. And separately, her A has been implicated in differentiation development and, and processes of aging, but, but the connections between them have, have not been well defined. And so what I'm going to try and convince you today is that the, the integrity of her A dependent processes during in utero development can influence uh, phenotypes of, of late life aging. And this work started um, really from the, the really kind of um, the, the work of a, you know, a really creative and, and fantastic postdoc in the lab who in, in, uh, in my lab in, in Glasgow back in the, the UK before I moved to, to San Diego. And this is Farad Jabba Hijazi, uh, who now has her own lab at the University of, of West of, of Scotland. And what Farah wanted to do was to understand more about the role of the her -A complex in, in vivo, okay? Because there's been a lot done in vitro, a lot done in embryonic stem cells, but, but really not an awful lot done on its in vivo functions. So Farah wanted a model to investigate her -A function in, in vivo. And after a lot of thought and consideration, she you know, arrived at this um, melanocyte model. And I think, um, the reasons for this will become apparent when I tell you a bit more about the biology of these cells. So, so these cells originate um, out of the neural crest at about E9.5, 10.5 of development when these bipotential uh, melanoblast and glial progenitor cells migrate out of the neural crest, uh, the, the SOX10 positive bipotential cells. They then differentiate further to generate these MITF DCT uh, kit positive melanoblast specific cells. And they then migrate uh, out of the, um, well, through the what's known as the dorsal lateral pathway into the epidermis and ultimately end up populating the, the hair follicles of the mouse uh, in two places. First of all, the, the, uh, the base of the hair follicle or the, or the bulb and this is where the mature differentiated melanocytes live. And this, these are the cells which are responsible for giving pigment um, color to the, to the coat of the mouse. Uh, and then there's a, a population of melanocyte stem cells which reside within the, the bulge of the hair follicle. And so these are the cells which 
um, through each round of the hair cycle, okay, so when the hair regresses and then regenerates, when the hair regenerates, these cells are responsible for regenerating the melanocytes and, and again, pigmenting the hair. So these are the, the stem cells here. So it's a really nice model. because you, So you can see the differentiated cells and also the, the, the immature, uh, undifferentiated stem cells, and you can tell them apart based upon their position within the hair follicle. Um, and obviously these mice, you know, these cells, you can see that the function of these cells, the mice are pigmented, but with age, the mice, the mice go gray. Uh, and that reflects the, the, the premature differentiation and exhaustion of the stem cells. And this model, these cells are also used as a model for cancer, obviously specifically melanoma. So it seemed to Farrow that this was a tractable in vivo model for, for um, studying progenitor and stem cell migration, proliferation, quiescence, terminal differentiation, aging, and cancer. So, so given that at the time we didn't really know much about her race function, this seemed like a good model to, to begin investigating. And so the first thing that, that Farrow did was to cross a, a conditional null her a allele that we'd made and previously published, crossed it to a tyrosinase CRE ER, which on the addition of, of tamoxifen allows tissue specific recombination and inactivation of her a specifically in the melanocytes and the um, melanocyte stem cells. And so when Farah did this, and, and actually, so what she did was to, she did this um, isolated. The, 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 the melanocytes from, the, from newborn mice uh, treated with tamoxifen. And you can see when she does that, there's efficient recombination and inactivation of, of her A. Um, but um, when she did this, there was no noticeable effect on the, the melanocytes um, that resulted, okay? I mean, that these are pigmented dendritic cells. There's no real difference between them. So it seemed that the cells didn't really care. And what's more, when she, she did this experiment and, and then aged the mice here, aging them for 18 months post-induction in the absence of, of her A, you can see that, again, there's, there's no obvious phenotype, okay? So the mice retain their, their pigment color as, as normal, um, wild type versus knockout. Now, this was a little surprising because at the same time, Farah had, had this result, which is an in vitro experiment using a a melanoblast cell line, okay? So these melanoblasts, these are the embryonic precursors to the melanocytes. So what Farah had also done was to inactivate her A in these melanoblasts. And when she did that, she saw a marked decrease in expression of various melanocytic specific markers, such as CKIT, uh, DCT, MITF, and, and SOX10. Okay, so it seems that in, in the melanoblasts, at least, HER-A is required for specification of the, the melanoblast melanocytic identity, even though inactivating in the, in the adult mice didn't seem to have any effect. So, so Farah then went back to the, to, the, to the in vivo experiments, but looked this time in, in embryos. And so here what she did was instead of taking a, a tyrosinase pre ER, and inactivating her A in the adult mice, she used a tyrosinase CRE, which inactivates her A right at the very earliest stages of development at about E10.5 of, of development. And so from this point on, the melanoblasts and the melanocytes and the melanocyte stem cells, um, from this point on in development, they are constitutively lacking the her A protein. And um, when she did this, and then looked at the melanoblasts in the developing embryo. And here, this is crossed to another reporter mouse, a DCT LACZ mouse, which allows us to stain the melanoblast blue. You can see that in the HER-A knockout embryos, there is a consistent decrease in the number of melanoblasts in the, in the developing embryo. Um, you'll see that the, 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 the difference between the wild type and the knockout tends to become smaller as the embryos develop, okay? And this will become important in a, in a few slides. So Farah wanted to understand more about this, this, this defect in the her knockout developing melanoblast. So she isolated 
these cells from the developing embryos, this time using a, a tyrosinase free uh, tomato so that the, uh, the melanoblasts are, are, are fluorescent labeled red and she could isolate them by, by fax analysis. And this was a protocol that she worked out with, uh, with, with Karthik, uh, another really talented postdoc in the lab of, of Laura Macheski at the Beatson. And, and Karthik, Karthik's kind of a, a card carrying um, melanocyte, melanoblast expert. So, so Farah and Karthik really kind of teamed up together to, to develop this, this protocol to, to isolate these, these, mel these uh, melanoblasts from the developing embryos. Uh, she then did single cell RNA sequencing on those and, and identified three different populations of cells, okay, the, the melanoblasts, staining with melanoblast specific markers, uh, the glial cell population that I mentioned earlier, and, and a little bit more surprisingly was a more mesenchymal type population um, indicated here. Um, and you'll see that the, uh, the, the melanoblasts and the glial cells as I indicated earlier, both staining positive for, for SOX10. So, so three different populations of, of cells. And then obviously what Farah and Karthik were interested in was to compare the abundance of these populations of cells between the wild type and the knockout embryos. And you can see that in the wild type embryos, the majority of the cells were these um, SOX10 positive glial and melanoblast precursors as expected. Um, but in the knockout embryos, there was a, a, a big decrease in the number of those cells and a big increase in the number of this, this mesenchymal cell population. And you can see if we break that down further into the, the glial cells and the melanoblasts, there is a, a significant decrease in the number of melanoblasts in the knockout embryos compared to the, the wild type embryos. So this supports the, um, you know, the the original in vitro result and the staining of the embryos showing that in the her, if we knock out her A specifically in the melanoblast, then that leads to a decrease and impaired specification of the melanoblast lineage in, in the embryos. We then you know, looked at that data a little bit more closely here, collaborating with Alex Wenzel and Jill Mezerov at, at, at UCSD. And they further broken this mesenchymal population of cells into, into two different clusters, which they call cluster one and cluster two. And interestingly, this cluster two is predominantly made up of the knockout cells. Okay, In the wild type embryos, this is quite a rare population. And it turns out that this, this cluster two of the knockout cells has signatures of uh, an epithelial to mesenchymal transition um, and an expression of, of genes indicative of that. And so our current, kind of work, current working hypothesis is that the, the embryonic HER-A knockout melanoblasts are depleted in the knockout embryos because they undergo a transdifferentiation or EMT-like process to generate these abnormal uh, mesenchymal cells. As I say, that's just a, a working hypothesis at this point. Um, but anyway, the next question that Farah wanted to ask is, um, you know, does this abnormal embryonic melanoblast development, does it have any effect on melanocytes and melanocyte stem cells um, and, and pigmentation of the, of the adult mice? Uh, everything I've shown you to this point has been in, in embryos. So surprisingly, given that the defect in the number of melanoblasts in the developing embryos that I've just shown you, it was surprising when when you know, Farah looks at the, the wild type and the knockout pups, and, and you can see that actually, you know, the knockouts are very close to, to normally pigmented, okay? There is a very slight hypopigmentation of the knockout compared to the wild type. And that actually appears to be due to a decrease in, in melanin deposition within the hair follicle, okay? Because actually, if, if we look at the number of melanocytes within the bulb of the hair follicle, okay, in, in mice of, you know, one, 10 or 33 days old, there's, there's basically no difference between the, between the wild type and the knockout, okay? The knockout have a very normal looking number of melanocytes and melanocyte stem cells. And so when Farah quantitated these, there was no discernible difference between the wild type 
and the knockout. And as I say, this is, this is surprising because, you know, I've just shown you that during embryogenesis, there is actually a depletion in the number of developing melanoblasts. And yet by birth, that difference is no longer detectable in the wild type versus knockout, okay? They're, they're very comparable. Um, having said that, um, these cells, these knockout cells do have apparent molecular defects, okay? So here what, what Farah has done is to stain the wild type and knockout embryos for histone H3.3, which I said is the, is the, the histone variant deposition substrate of, of HER-A. And you can see that in the, in the wild type, these um, histone H3.3 is enriched within these DCT positive melanocytes within the bulb of the hair follicle. Okay, that's the red staining here. But in the knockout, although the melanocytes are still there in, in the bulb, they no longer stain positive for histone H3.3, okay, or very much depleted for H3.3. So, so there is a, a defect in 3.3 deposition within these HERA knockout melanocytes. What's more, when Farah tried to isolate these cells from the embryos and then expand, sorry, from, this, is, this is from newborn mice. She isolated these cells from, from newborn mice and then tried to expand them in culture. You can see that the wild type cells uh, proliferate and expand um, just fine. And they generate these uh, monolayers of, of pigmented uh, DCT positive melanocytes. When she tried exactly the same protocol with the her -A knockout, these cells don't proliferate to generate um, pigmented cells, okay? So, so these knockout melanoblasts have a marked defect in proliferation in in vitro. And consistent with that, in the, the melanocytes of the newborn mice, uh, in collaboration with Jao Passos and Anthony Lagnado at, at Mayo Clinic, we can see that these uh, the knockout cells do actually have increased abundance of these um, of DNA damage at their, their telomeres. These are so-called telomere-associated DNA damage foci. And these are commonly used as a marker of, of cell senescence or aging or, or cell stress, okay? So in, in suggesting perhaps that these knockout melanoblasts, although they're there and they're viable and they're and they generate and they're, they're pigmented, they, they, they might have underlying molecular defects which, which limit their proliferation and, and renewal. So, as I say, the, these, at least in the newborn mice, the, the knockout melanocytic cells are, are there and, and they are, are pigmented, but they do show uh, these, these apparent molecular defects. So we wondered, well, you know, how is this going to impact upon the, the aging of, of these mice? So, so what Farah did next was to then age these mice to, to 20 months old. And you can see that the, the, the wild type mice age, you know, as expected by 20 months old, these mice are still normally pigmented. But by this point, the Hurray knockout mice have a very dramatic premature hair graying phenotype. So that by you know, two years old, these mice are, are pretty much white. And not surprisingly, we can see that there's less pigment within the hair follicles of these knockout mice. And when Farah did this uh, sequential depilation assay, uh, and this is, this is basically just a kind of a repetitive waxing protocol, okay? You basically strip the hair out of the follicles on, on, on half of the mouse, and, and you're challenging the hair follicles and the hair to regenerate, and therefore the melanocyte stem cells to, re to regenerate the pigment. And you can see that over, over a few cycles of that, the knockout melanocyte stem cells are very much impaired in their ability to, to regenerate the, the pigment. So this is typically taken to be an indication of a defect in the melanocyte stem cells. And, and so confirming that, Farah could show that um, as the mice age, there is a, a, a depletion of the melanocytes themselves in the knockout, and also a marked depletion of the, the melanocyte stem cells within the, 
within the bulge of the hair follicle. So, um, so we think this underlies the, the, the premature hair graying phenotype that I've shown you, and that is that with age, these HERA knockout melanocyte stem cells become exhausted and depleted, leading to, leading to a decrease in the number of mature melanocytes. So I'm just gonna summarize what I've shown you then and then, and then um, present the model. The, the first point is that inactivation of HERA in young adult mice has no detectable effect, um, but HERA is required for normal development of the SOX10 positive melanoblast and glial cell lineages early in, in embryogenesis. So despite this defect during early embryogenesis, this defect appears to be largely corrected by birth, such that the mice are born essentially normally pigmented and with, with normal numbers of melanocytes and melanocyte stem cells. However, the, this embryonic HERA deficiency does ultimately result in a, in a premature depletion of the adult melanocyte stem cell population and therefore hair growth. And so what we think is happening then is that, you know, her A has a role to play in specification of, of melanoblasts up, up here. And if that function is, is impaired, at, at the time of birth, it doesn't have any obvious effect, but, but the kind of the, the consequences are, are transmitted through the long term, potentially through depletion of histone H3.3 or through telomeric damage. And that ultimately results in this premature hair grain phenotype of the, of the adult mice. And so to put that another way, we think that her A histone H3.3 is required for specification of melanoblasts in, in the embryo. Inactivation of her A leads to a decrease in the number of, of melanoblasts. That decrease can be then compensated for by some, some mechanism which we, you know, we think of as, as a type of, of developmental homeostasis, okay? So that the, the, the decrease in number can be corrected for during embryogenesis, but that correction process, you know, does have uh, long-term consequences, perhaps stressing the cells through epigenetic dysregulation or telomere dysfunction, that leads to premature aging of the melanocyte stem cells and therefore a premature hair graying phenotype. And so during, we think then that during in utero development, epigenetic defects in lineage differentiation can be rectified by intrinsic homeostatic mechanisms, but this it comes at the expense of premature aging in later life. Uh, and this raises the possibility that in utero manipulations of developmental integrity, for example, through diet, could actually be used to promote late life healthy aging. Uh, and I think, you know, personally, I think that, you know, that's an exciting possibility because it, as I say, it raises the, the possibility that through, for example, dietary interventions at, at this point, we can impact on healthy aging, you know, 70 or 80 years later in, you know, in, in that, that same person, which I think is, you know, quite an exciting possibility for healthy aging of populations. Um, so that's my last slide. I'll just give you my acknowledgements. Um, as I say, the vast majority of, of what I've shown you has been done by, by Farah, a former postdoc in the lab, now has her own lab at University of West of Scotland. Um, and, and Farah worked closely with, with Karthik, a really great postdoc in in Laura Macheski's lab at the, at the Beetson Institute. And Karthik also has his own lab at the University of, of Bradford in, in the UK. And I mentioned a few other collaborations along the way. Um, this is the, the current lab. And uh, we are actually you know, currently recruiting for, for postdocs. So if you're interested, please, please drop me a line. And with that, I will take questions if there are any. Thank you. All right, well, uh, thanks, Peter. That was thanks, fabulous. Um, and, and it seems like there's yet another reason for blaming our mothers for everything that went wrong with us. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> I, I'm a little wary when I propose that thing, but I, mean, I think from an objective um, point of view, yeah, but 
don't want to get sucked into the other side of it. Yeah, so are there any questions? Uh, I don't see any in the chat yet, which is great because that allows me to ask a question. Uh, so, so would you expect the same phenotype then if you decreased her A um, amounts or her A expression in these cells? I know you, I don't think you can delete it because that would be lethal, but what would you see if you delete uh, H33? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't, tried that i uh you know i guess obviously deleting 3.3 .3 can be perhaps more profound than just inhibiting her a because obviously there are her a independent uh pathways for deposition of h3.3 .3. so you know through uh atrx and, and dax so so conceivably you know the the depletion or of h3.3 .3 might be more profound we haven't we haven't tried that and, and do, do you think there's like another hidden role for for the her a complex uh do, is there any evidence to believe that because we just kind of know it as a exchange factor yeah I, well yeah i guess i've kind of been doing this long enough to think that there's a hidden role for every every <laughs> gene and every protein True that. Um, and if you can find those hidden roles, then you know that's uh, that's generally a, an exciting thing to do. Um, so I mean, we I don't have any direct insights into that, but uh, it certainly wouldn't at all surprise me. Yeah, uh, I mean that the whole complex. I mean, you know, even you know the cabin one protein in in the complex. Okay, I mean the the whole function of that protein is still very mysterious okay as far as i know there's no specific function attributed to cabin one in terms of histone h3.3 deposition mm -hmm. we know that her a is the scaffold and the U ubn1 binds to h3.3 and the asf1 is kind of you know the, the delivery shuttle but quite what cabin one is doing we don't know and cabin one's a very big protein um so i think so you know that that would that would suggest that yeah the complex probably does have other functions yeah so there's one question <laughs> and kind of echoing what i was scared about too she says uh priyatama says this is scary many pregnant women mothers puke during pregnancy would that make them malnutritious and can that cause diseased aging in the offspring later as well yeah um yeah i I, I guess I, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I guess I'm, I wouldn't want people to read, you know, too much into this um, from, from, from that perspective. I think there's, there's an awful lot more that we, we need to understand. Um, you know, I think, you know, comparing, I think, you know, puking during pregnancy to the, you know, the famine in the Netherlands at the, the end of the second world war i think you know those are I mean, well, obviously you know one is much more extreme than than the other so i, yeah, I wouldn't sure. worry that that the two are equivalent and then there was a question by john Pugh: can you calculate the extra cell divisions needed for the homeostasis versus yeah premature that's, aging yeah that's a that's a, is a really that's a really interesting aspect of this this kind of you know developmental homeostasis i've done a little bit of you know looking into that and you know i mean the view i had about i guess embryonic development came from you know what we know about worms which is that the whole process is very tightly regulated and and every fate has a every every cell has a specific fate and that's how you get the 900 odd cells the worm i think in you know in higher organisms it's a lot more plastic than that okay so that that you know the amount of death or the amount of proliferation can uh, vary, and there's there are these there is this potential for kind of intrinsic homeostatic mechanisms. We haven't, I mean, in actual fact, we haven't noted, we haven't detected an increase in proliferation of the of the HER-A knockout, um, and so actually we don't think that the compensation necessarily comes about through increased proliferation. It might come about through increased through through decreased death, 
Okay, there is known to be death of melanoblasts during embryogenesis, so a decrease in death might be responsible. But the other possibility is that there's, um, you know, that there's a, a kind of a trans differentiation back from the melano from the mesenchymal cells back to the to the to the to the melanoblasts. Okay, so that there's there are there's kind of other possibilities which we're trying to to differentiate between. But at the moment, we don't have any any evidence that the the compensation is due to increased proliferation of the HER8 knockout. Hey, Carolyn, if it's okay, I'd like to ask Peter a question. Sure. Uh, I, could, I can't write into the uh, Q&A. Go for it. We have still have time. Great. Hi, Peter. Hi, Gary. Uh, hey, um, I was wondering if you have already or plan to look at other tissues or organs in those knockout mice um, to see what's going on there, if there was evidence of uh, DNA damage, um, telomere breaks, etc. Um. So, no, we haven't. I mean, what we, what we have noticed is that, um, I can stop sharing, I think. Um, um, we have noticed that um, there appears to be defects, and this is just for, through, you know, just looking at the embryos that, there appears to be defects in kind of innovation of the nerves in, in the limbs, which, you know, is perhaps consistent with the, the knockout in the, the, the glial cells, which, you know, can give rise to um, nerve cells, I think. But um, we haven't really looked beyond this, this one lineage at the moment. I mean, obviously, you know, we're very interested in you know, whether this does extrapolate to, to other lineages. But to do that, we would probably have to make different mice because this is a specific knockout in this, you know, primarily in this, this melanoblast glial lineage. So if we wanted to look at other lineages, we'd have to use other, other creed drivers. Oh, okay. 